Okay then, so let's have a, a discussion about flywheels. What I'm going to do, as always, I'm going to try and outline the topic, show you some uh, slight prerequisite information that we need to be aware of. Then I'm going to derive some equations. That's where most people start falling asleep, I think. But I'm going to show you the derivation in some of the equations. A lot of it's basically algebraic manipulation this time. Um, and then we're going to get into some questions where you're going to use the equations. So what it will boil down to from your point of view is being aware of the terminology, uh, being aware of the equations and then sort of choosing appropriate equations, manipulating them appropriately to solve uh, the problems we're given. The essence of what we're doing really is from a design perspective, we're going to be given parameters related to a fluctuation in energy of a particular system that we're considering. And we've got to design a flywheel that usually involves working out the dimensions or working out the masses involved to accommodate the situation that we're given in, in the question. So it's got a kind of very practical orientation feel. What you're seeing on the screen there is just some uh, information I uh, gleaned. I've shown you a, a crankshaft from an engine and on the uh, right hand side you see that huge flywheel there that's used to try and keep a constant torque output from the engine. Obviously the torque in the engine as we'll talk about in a moment varies because of the, the cycle of the engine um, but we want to try and produce a constant torque from that and that's what the flywheel does. It allows the, the torque to remain more or less constant within limits anyway. So the flywheel you've seen, there's like a solid chunk of metal there. Sometimes you'll see flywheels like on the left-hand side where they have thicker rims. If you look at the rim, I try, I try to do a section through AA here, as I call it, uh, and that's this up here. And, and that's what the rim would look like, uh, sort of like a, a T section, like a flange at the rim, because often with these kind of uh, designs, you want the mass to be as far away from the center of rotation as possible, because that gives it what's called the bigger inertia which we'll look at in just a moment. So you do see solid flywheels like the one you can see there on the right hand side associated with the crankshaft, that's not uncommon, but you also sometimes see these more substantial uh, flanges on the outside of the flywheel and that's because they're trying to uh, increase the inertia of the flywheel and reduce the overall mass of the flywheel. So different configurations of flywheel. We will only be analysing the flywheel shown on the right hand side, the constant section flywheels you'll be pleased to hear. But we, we could analyse, there's no reason why we couldn't analyse the uh, more complicated shapes uh, with the uh, T section if you like it, the at the, at the rim we could do that um, but the syllabus doesn't want that so we're going to stick to solid flywheels in our analysis here's some reference information as always i try and give you a little bit of background information because you didn't study the the level four mechanics there are certain things that are missing from uh, level five but it's not seems to be causing you any problem up to now here's some uh, terminology that we need to be aware of i call it reference information here we have covered some of these before but i'm just recapping some of the terminology in this little slide here we mentioned about moment of inertia when we're looking at clutches it came up in that topic area the moment of inertia as it's uh, sometimes termed. Sometimes it's called mass moment of inertia, by the way. But the moment of inertia is basically the resistance to motion. Okay, if you think about uh, in, in linear motion, when we're looking at Newton's laws of motion, we have sort of F equals MA, that kind of equation. Then the mass was the resistance to motion. The bigger the mass, the bigger the force required to, to accelerate the, the shaft uh, or accelerate the system we're looking at. And in a rotational sense, in an angular motion sense, this inertia, this I symbol, which is given a symbol I, is the resistance to motion in the angular sense. So there are moment of inertia of this flywheel here. This has got like a moment of inertia for the flywheel. That's a characteristic of the flywheel. So and often in the calculations we're going to look at, we will be very interested in calculating the moment of inertia because that will actually help us then find the geometrical considerations or the, the mass properties of the flywheel. So you'll see that moment of inertia, the symbol I, will crop up in some of the questions. Uh, probably actually most of the questions, to be honest. And moment of inertia is defined, as it shows there at the top of the slide, as I is equal to mk squared. And that's a very standard form, if you look that up in the textbook. Moment of inertia I is equal to mk squared, where m is the mass of the flywheel, in kilograms of course. And this k term, it's actually k squared in the formula, but the k term is called the radius of gyration. So k, often a symbol used for radius of gyration. And that's really a fictitious property. It's trying to say that's a location within the flywheel. I'm showing it here in this sort of diagram here. Where dimension K is a location from the origin, 
from the shaft rotation, if you like, to some point in the flywheel, up where all the mass can be considered to act from a point of view of a, a, an analysis, a sort of a, a theoretical analysis. It's kind of analogous uh, to a centre of gravity, really, because in the centre of gravity, your mass may be spread out of a very large area, but you can actually consider the centre of mass to be where all the mass is concentrated. You can balance something on your finger. Uh, you know, If you've got an object like a plate or something, you can balance it on your finger if you put it under the centre of gravity because all the mass can be assumed to act through that point. And the same kind of thing in an angular context when you're rotating a flywheel, a circular disc is shown in the picture there, you can assume that all the mass can be considered to act at the what's called the radius of gyration. And you can prove these formulae from the calculus, that's where they're all proved from. So um, we're not going to go into the proof of them, we're going to accept the, the formulas given here, but that's where they come from, from calculus analysis. So notice in the two little equations I've given here, one is for a solid section flywheel there, so just a D outside diameter of some thickness. The K squared term, that's a radius adjacent squared, is equal to the outside diameter squared divided by 8. Okay, so D squared upon 8. And if you look at the formula below, this is for an annular section, like a hollow section. But the questions will dictate whether they're, they're solid sections or they're hollow sections. Notice that the K squared term now is given as capital D. That's the outside diameter squared added to lowercase d, the inside diameter squared, divided by 8. Again, they're given without proof. But they will crop up in some of the questions when we're trying to, say, find the outside diameter in the particular analysis. And the final little equation we're going to use at the bottom of the slide there, we've probably come across this before, kinetic energy, half I omega squared, where of course omega is the angular velocity of the flow, and that'll be given in the question. I is the moment of inertia. And that's analogous to the uh, kinetic energy of linear motion. You probably remember back in the day we had kinetic energy was equal to a half mv squared, and remember that equation, the half mv squared, that's linear motion equivalent where the m is the mass and the v is the linear velocity. Here we've got the uh, i is the uh, moment of inertia and the omega is the angular velocity. But, but an analogous formula between the two, uh, two equations there, okay? Just define radius duration for you, just for sort of completeness really. So the radius duration, often given symbol k, it is often convenient to consider the total mass of a rotating body, like a flywheel, as being concentrated a fixed distance from an axis of rotation. So this may be done provided the moment of inertia of the body uh, about the axis of rotation is the same, which it will be in our case. So the radius of duration, symbol K, is defined as the distance from the axis of rotation at which the total mass of the body, in our case the flywheel, will be considered to be concentrated so that the moment of inertia, symbol I, of the body about the axis remains the same. So it's just used for analysis purposes, that's all. It's, it's a theoretical uh, dimension. I've tried to show it here in the little cut through of the T-section flywheel, where we've got an outside rim. You can see that the, the radius duration will be dragged outside towards the rim there because most of the mass is at the rim. And the reason why you, and that's a good um, that's a good design there is because, of course, all, all the mass at the rim means the moment of inertia will be bigger because the radius duration is bigger. So often you see flywheels designed with that kind of configuration. So K comes from the center line of the rotation. All right, so that's a bit of background there. Now the SI unit for the mass moment of inertia, you get it from the formula as always, mass would be in kilograms, so kilograms, and K radius duration would be in meters, so meters squared. So kilogram meter squared is the SI unit of mass moment of inertia. And please always use kilograms and always use meters in dynamics. Even if the question gives you the geometry in millimeters, you must use meters in dynamics or else you can get um, errors in the, in the calculation. So be careful of that. Uh, just some pictures, I just found these on the internet, just some pictures of very large flywheels. Again, you can see the, the concept here of having the mass, the, the large mass at the periphery. There these spokes obviously joined into the, uh, the hub here where the shaft is. So in both instances there, nice, uh, nice chunky bits of material out from the shaft and giving this, this large moment of inertia, giving a large radius duration, okay. 
put them in especially for Scott because he probably likes those kind of designs, don't you, Scott, coming from coming from the Railway Museum there. Um, anyway, that's two shows of the typical fly was on. I'm just showing you this for reference. This is just uh, um, what industry would use. This is relates to mass moments of inertia for, they call it simple shapes here, just an extract from a book I found. So the moments of inertia shown there and the radius duration for a variety of sections are in the table here. So we start off with what's going to call a hoop section here. Notice they actually give moment of inertia in two directions because, of course, sometimes you might want it to consider moment of inertia out of plane as well. But we'll only be interested in rotating about the AA axis as they determine it here. So notice they give you the I, which is the M R squared. They're saying it's a very, very small hoop. So the, the R is the K in that case. So K squared is equal to R squared. And then you've got the cylinder rotating. Of course, you have a cylinder section. So the I is given a half M and the R squared there and then the k squared is a half uh, r squared and there's other sections the hollow cylinder we've got got a cone section we've got a spear section there's a torus section there and bar there's so many sections just showing you this is very standard mass moments of inertia formula you just find in textbooks that's all and you just choose the appropriate one and the appropriate axis there of course to rotate about but we're we're just looking at about the a axis in that particular case so this is about just background information that's all I'm just going to talk through uh, very briefly the uh, background to the flywheel topic area and then we'll get into doing some calculations later on. So let's start with the combustion engine cycle because that's a, a main reason why we need to have a flywheel because of the characteristics of the combustion engine. So this is the working cycle. I'm sorry this might be sort of very elementary to some of you, but I'll just go through this very briefly here. We've got this four-stage working cycle. We've got the first stroke, as they're called here, stroke the working, or sometimes called the power stroke. That's where the uh, pressure is rising due to the engine firing and gas exploding, and it forces the piston, uh, they call it outwards, I'm calling it downwards in my little diagram there. So that's the power stroke there where the the gases have been compressed and they're being ignited there. So it's pushing the piston down. I call it power stroke, I think, in my notes here. Next stroke we've got is the what's called the exhaust stroke. This is where the cylinders are now moving upwards here. Okay, so the gas is uh, being exhausted from the piston and moves back upwards. Then we move into the uh, suction cycle. Again, the piston's coming down now. So the gas is being sucked into the cylinder in our third uh, figure there. And finally, we've got the compression cycle. This is the fourth picture there. Now we're compressing the, the gases ready for firing again. And the whole cycle repeats itself. That's probably a very standard um, process you're aware of. But that's the, the four-stage process of our, of our engine. Now what we've got to consider is this variation in torque. The output torque from a reciprocating engine um, does vary greatly over the working cycle. You'll see that in a moment. So if the engine is driving a, a generator which offers constant resisting torque, the resulting speed will vary because the engine torque at times is greater than and then sometimes less than the resisting torque of the output. So that can be problematic. So in order to reduce this, this fluctuation in speed we get from the engine driving a generator, we use the flywheel. And the idea is that the flywheel will be used within the engine to absorb the energy at points in the cycle, and then it will also release energy at other points in the cycle. So the flywheel inertia depends on the fluctuation of the speed that's acceptable in the particular system we're going to look at. And you'll see when we look at the derivation of formula and then into the questions, you'll see that in some of the questions they will give you a range of fluctuation. I think it's actually called the symbol A, the formula, that will, will be acceptable for this particular design. And we'll have to design our flywheel to accommodate that range of speeds for the variation in torque that's occurring. And you'll see this in the questions as we get through to the questions. I'm showing you here a torque or a turning moment diagram. And what we've got here is an output torque, capital T, on the vertical axis. And it's plotted for an engine against the crank angle, angle theta. And that would usually be in radians. That's on the horizontal axis. So our torques would be in newton meters and our crank angle would be in radians there. And I'm trying to show you the four strokes again there. The working stroke, the exhaust stroke, the suction stroke and the compression stroke. 
So the shaded area under the turning moment diagram or the torque diagram relates to the work done during a complete cycle. And work done, don't forget, is newton meters or joules. Uh, it's energy, basically. And the horizontal axis there is dimension, it's in radians. So the area under the diagram is actually work or energy. What we're showing here is a mean torque on both diagrams, this mean torque line. That's the torque output that we want to try and keep constant as best we can within, within the parameter here. So the areas above and below the mean torque line shown in the diagram, they're supposed to be equal. Here shown there, these little areas, we add up the areas here, they uh, should uh, equal to zero because the above and below are the same areas, so they cancel each other out. Okay, so that's one of the problems we've got with the engine. We've got this variation in torque continually varying, but we really want a, a more or less a constant torque output from our device. So as I said before, from the torque diagram or the turn the moment diagram, the area under the graph is the work done during the cycle. And if you want the mean engine torque, you want to calculate the, the actual mean engine torque, it's the work done during the cycle, the area under the graph, uh, divided by the total angle that's turned through in our um, four-stage process here. So the uh, mean torque is the restoring torque if the mean speed is to remain constant. That would be our objective, to try and keep, a, as best we can, a constant uh, output. To show you this, a turning moment diagram, we've got some values on this diagram. If you just think of what's happening with the speeds here, we're going from A right the way through to E in various stages. So at A, which is where the the gas ignites and we have our power stroke here. We've got a lot of energy going in the system as that piston is forced down and they're showing its energy. It's just typical values here. So 4,400 newton meters is energy put into our system in this particular case. A lot of energy input going into there. So the speed at A will be slower than the speed at B. At B, the speed will be increasing because we've got this large energy going into our system. Between B and C, we have output. This is where the gases are being forced out of the cylinder. If we go back to our four-stage process, so any energy comes out of the system. So at point C, the speed now of the engine is actually slower than it is at B. It's higher than it is at A, but it's slower than it was at B. If we now look at the point D, third stroke in our cycle, what we've got here is energy going into the system again, or energy coming, energy input which is 1300 newton meters there. So that will actually speed up our process. That's going into the system. Um, so the speed at D will actually be greater than the speed at C and greater than the speed at B as well, because we've got an excess of energy going into the system when you look at numerical values. And then the final stroke, the fourth stroke in our cycle, it takes us from D through to E here. And that's where the energy is coming out of the system and returning the speed back to what it is at A. So in that particular cycle there, the speed at D is the maximum speed in our system. The speed at B is the next highest one in the system. And then the speed of C uh, comes in. And then the, the back to begin it again, the speed of A and E are the same, okay? All I'm trying to highlight with you there is that there's a variation in speed and what we will find in the calculations it will have to limit our variation in speed so we'll be given parameters to which we must comply with to design our flywheel but I'm just trying to highlight that how the variation in speed occurs throughout this, the working cycle of the engine there. So just take from that the fact that the speed is varying as we go through the cycle of the engine. So the flywheels are designed to accommodate what's termed the largest fluctuation in energy. You often see the symbol delta E used in this work. That's really changing kinetic energy, really. But delta E is often used in the, the, the analysis of flywheels. So it's that change in energy, that maximum change in energy we will have that occurs during the cycle is what we will need to accommodate when we design our flywheel. So the delta E is between the minimum and maximum speed, if you like, but on a diagram, it will be where the greatest torque occurs. So looking at the diagram above, the maximum change of energy we would have to accommodate there is the 4,550 newton meters. That would be our delta E to use the notation given below here. And you'll see again that in the questions uh, when we get to the questions. Again, that just talks you through the turning moment diagram shown above there. So the delta E in this case is just the biggest value we show on our turning moment diagrams.
and that's the Dell D we'd have to design for. That's the biggest change of energy we've got in the cycle. Okay, what I'm going to do now is go through some equations. There's going to be a lot of them. I'm going to go through as briefly as I can, trying to show you how to derive. So I will summarize the formulas at the end of the you know, little this little section, and then you'll 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 have a little table of them. They are summarized in your formula sheets for reference, um, and then I'll get you in some questions of where we need to uh, need to apply the various formulas. All right. So bear with me for the moment. I'm just going to go through this reasonably quickly. Um, just look at some terminology here. You need to be aware of some of the characteristics of the um, design of flywheels. This is very specialist design again, a bit like gears and a bit like belt drives and friction clutches. Very specialist design. So there are certain terminology that are used in this particular um, in this particular area. So let's consider fluctuations of speed and energy um, by respect of the areas uh, from the curves of our torque diagram on the previous slide, above and below the mean torque line, we get maximums and minimum speed. Try to highlight that to you, okay? And we'll call them omega max and omega min in the work we're going to do. So the difference of energy supplied and energy required between these points accounts for the change in speed. Uh, and it's termed the fluctuation of energy. That's that delta E symbol. It's actually changing kinetic energy, but uh, we call it fluctuation of energy um, in, the, in this work we're going to do. So we know that I is the moment of inertia of our rotating parts in kilogram meters squared. Now, omega max, I'm using lowercase omega here, so don't forget lowercase omega in the work I uh, undertake. I always consider that to be radians per second, and you always want radians per second in this work, okay? So omega max is the uh, maximum speed um, during the cycle, and omega min is the minimum speed in the cycle. And it, as to where that occurs depends on the distribution of energy that's occurring. We showed in the, the diagram it occurred towards the end of the uh, four-stage process on the previous slide, but it, it can change its position, but we're not really too bothered about that. We just know there's a maximum minimum angular velocity to consider. So kinetic energy, we know from previous work, is a half I omega squared, analogous to our half mv squared in linear motion. What I'm doing here is calculating the change in kinetic energy, the half I omega maximum velocity squared minus the half I omega minimum velocity squared. Okay, we often call that, as I said, fluctuation of energy, delta E in this work. So I can write equation one in terms of delta E, that's all, and the change in uh, velocities here. So half I, and in brackets, omega uh, max squared minus omega min squared. That's the delta E, the fluctuation of energy, equation two. Repeated equation two for convenience. So the speed of fluctuation... The if it's small compared to the mean speed, the omega mean, we can simply write the omega mean. There's nothing sort of drastic here. We're just really might write it as the averages of the omega max plus the omega min divided by uh, 2. All right. So half of omega max plus omega min divided by 2 is just the average, uh, um, uh, the average angle of the omega mean. And they're assuming there that the variation between omega max and omega min is, is fairly small. All we've done with equation 3 is, is write that equation in terms of omega max plus omega min is equal to 2 times the mean speed. So just multiply both sides by 2 here to get an equation 3 here. Okay, from equation 2, we note that it can be written mathematically in this form, shown below. This is uh, in equation uh, 4 here. So what they've done, they've taken this part, the omega max squared minus the omega min squared, and they're writing it in this format here. So what they're doing is using a bit of bit of maths, that's all, a bit of algebra here, because basically uh, this expression, the x squared minus y squared, which is equivalent to equation two here, can be written algebraically as the product of the sum and difference of the same two terms here. So that's just a mathematical, um, an algebraic kind of characteristic there. If we uh, multiply x plus y by x minus y, we get x squared minus y squared. And they're reversing the process. They're saying, well, we're given, if you like, uh, x squared minus y squared. We're going to write it as um, x plus y multiplied by x minus y. That's what they're doing here uh, in that purple line there. Again, don't worry too much about that. You're not going to be asked to prove it, but that's where that equation comes from. And what I've done next is they've uh, substituted equation 3. So I just highlighted equation 3 up here um, for convenience. So substitute equation 3 
into equation four. So that equation there is going into this equation. So we've got the omega max plus omega min is going to be replaced by this two omega min. And notice that the, the half has disappeared now because the half multiplied by two are that cancel each other out. So we end up with this i multiplied by omega mean and then the bracketed term for equation 5, just manipulating the equations. They divide the equation 5 by omega mean here, so they've had to square the omega mean on the top line to do that. You might say, well, they're doing that. They're doing this because they're going to get to a particular characteristic that's relevant in this particular type of work. So equation 6 just manipulated equation 5 by dividing by the omega mean. Just read equation six there for convenience. Now they use this, what's called a coefficient of fluctuation in a lot of the calculations, symbol A. It's the change in speed divided by the mean speed. So A, term the coefficient of fluctuation, can be written as the uh, change of speed, so omega max minus omega min, divided by the mean speed. That's what we've got here. So what they're doing basically now is kind of replacing this here, they're going to replace that then with the symbol A. So that's where the A comes from. So they've gone from equation 6, if you like, to equation 8 by using equation 7. And this A characteristic is, is quite an important characteristic in the design of flywheel. So the reason why they, they've kind of manipulated the equation in that format, because you often get A given in the questions, because it's something that you will will need to be aware of. And A is the variation in speed. It's often given in percentage terms, so be careful how you use it. If it's given as plus or minus 2% in a question, don't forget that means plus or minus 0 0.02, okay, because we've gone from percentage there to the decimal. But the actual A value will be 0 0.04. Okay, so be careful with the way you use the A's in the question. They'll always be given in percentage terms because that's the way they converse in this topic area. So put that into decimals and then you've got a plus and a minus variation. Um, and so the A is going to be the, the range of that. So that's the 0 0.04. So just be careful where the A's occur. But equation 8 is quite a useful equation. You'll see that crop up in some of the work because often we will know in the questions the change in energy and we'll know the limits we've got on the speed variation that we're allowed. We will know the mean speed that we're uh, trying to achieve and from that we can calculate the moment of inertia, the flywheel, which is a parameter we need to be aware of. So you'll see that equation 8 is actually quite a useful equation in the questions we're going to look at. Just continue with the derivations here, more of this stuff. They've got a coefficient b, which sometimes cropped up, not too often uh, today, I don't think, but it sometimes crops up. This is maximum fluctuation of energy in the cycle. That's the delta E symbol divided by the work done per cycle, um, which is W here. So again, they're manipulating equations. I won't really labor this. From equation 5, they can now write the equation 8 in this form here, give you equation 9. And what they've done with equation 10 here, they've substituted equation 7 into it. There's equation 7. It's been substituted, so they've just put in sort of um, this value here. They're putting this in for this bit here, and they're putting omega mean at the bottom. So that's why they've got to square the omega mean on equation 10. So all of, it's all algebraic manipulation here. Don't worry too much about it, but that's where they're coming from. And again, this parameter B in some questions is quite important. So parameters A and B are characteristics of the flywheels we're trying to design. But parameter A is primarily the one that's going to help us design particular flywheels in this case. Exercise 1. In a single cylinder four-stroke engine, we've got a mean speed given to us, 300 RPM. And we're running against a constant load torque. So the torque diagram has areas as shown in the table above and below the mean torque line. So they were given to us these in kilojoules in particular case for the complete working cycles. So that's in the table. Speed variation is between 295 and 305 RPM. We've got to calculate the moment of inertia for the system. We've given in the question. Okay, so what the question wants us to do is to actually sketch the the torque diagram, so I've sketched it for you there, um, show where the change energies are. They gave in the question the uh, mean angular velocity, notice it was in RPM, don't forget we must convert them in terms of radians per second every time you have to convert them, so I use this lowercase omega symbol just to make sure I, I, I do that, so my capital omegas are the RPMs which is the way the questions will be worded but the lowercase omegas is what we have to calculate. And you do the same for all the questions. Make sure you always calculate these 
angular velocity in terms of the radians per second. Uh, so I draw my diagram. I can find straight away, just by the table really, where the greatest change in energy occurs. In this particular case, we can see it's 7,000 newton meters in the first part of the cycle, first stroke in this case. So that would be the delta E in our equation. So the delta E is the maximum energy minus the minimum energy. So that's delta E. We can calculate the A value because we've got the maximum minimum um, omegas. We've got the mean omegas. We can calculate the value of A in this case in the calculation that we need. Um, we've got the omega mean in the question. So we can rearrange the equation to find the I value. So I'm trying to find the moment of inertia. It's a moment of inertia in this case. All right. It's a bit of transposition. So the change in energy divided by the A divided by the omega mean squared would give us the um, value of the moment of inertia there. And that's a kind of typical type of question. That's a very straightforward question there. But using the appropriate equation, we can find the moment of inertia. And then from that, we'll be able to find other parameters later on. Depends on what the question wants us to find. Okay, so just summing up really here, our flywheel is basically a reservoir of energy. It's, a, it's an energy storage device that's uh, used in lots of applications. It absorbs this mechanical energy by increasing its angular velocity at some times in the cycle, and then it releases the energy by decreasing its angular velocity at other times in the cycle. Okay. So mechanical energy is input into the, the flywheel by a torque. So we're not going to be looking at the torques in any great detail today, but obviously there are torques applied here, input and output torques, and that's often provided by motors and engines as well. So the fly was accelerated to its operating speed, which increases its, its inertial energy, as that's sometimes termed, and that's used to help drive the load after an accelerating torque is removed. So it helps to, to keep the motion as constant as possible uh, in the particular systems we're considering. Again, I'm just really showing the, the um, radius duration formula again here, just summarizing them. So speed variations of an engine or motor can be alleviated by the inclusion of a flywheel in the system. And the moment of inertia I of the flywheel is chosen. That's something we'll be trying to calculate and design to ensure that the variation of speed remains between defined limits of operation. Um, so we'll be given things like mean speed and then the deviation from the mean speed. And I said to you before, if uh, an example an engine flywheel required to remain within, they'll give the values as in terms of percentages, plus or minus 2%. Be careful that is plus or minus 0.02 of the mean speed and that's uh, an a value of 0 0.04 of course i'm just repeating these radius duration calculations i call it 11 here for moment of inertia and then the radius duration calculations there if you want the formulas for the solid disk and for the hollow section disk they're given there without proof don't forget though when sometimes students do forget this you're actually calculating from these formulae the radius duration squared and the question probably wants you to find the radius duration in some instances so just be careful uh, what you actually state as your final answers and there's a summary of the equations but more than this there are more uh, equations in your in your booklet than i've got there but those are the ones we'll be using so that's a summary of all the equations we'll use in the work we're going to do I did put the units on just for reference as well. Fluctuation energy is in newton meters or joules. Angular acceleration, if that occurs in our calculations, that will be radians per second squared. Angular velocity is radians per second. Mass moment of inertia is kilogram meters squared. The Ke terms, delta E terms are the same in joules. Mass must be in kilograms and radius duration must be in meters. All right, do not use millimeters in this work. Okay, now I'm going to take you through some calculations. This is a bit I quite enjoy. I quite enjoy these calculations. I know that sound, makes me sound very boring, but I really do like this little topic area. Um, never designed a flywheel myself in anger as such, but um, I can see it could be a bit of fun to design flywheels. Exercise two. If the moment of inertia of a flywheel is large, then a large quantity of energy can be absorbed without appreciable change in angular speed. The inertia of the flywheel in this particular case is given as 1,000 kilograms meters squared, and it's rotating at 120 RPM. If a speed increase of 10% is now induced, calculate the percentage increase in stored kinetic energy. So actually in this particular question, they just want us to do a calculation on change of kinetic energy. So this is kind of just warming us up, I think, this question here. So going to let you do this question. So if you read the information from the question, you've got a moment of inertia, symbol I, 
and that's a thousand kilogram meters squared. Fly one at a thousand kilogram meters squared. We're given in the question the um, angular speed. So we take the 120 RPM. So angular speed 120 RPM. We've got to find the change in kinetic energy if the speed is increased by 10%. So I've kind of labored this solution. I've um, accounted for my increase in 10% by actually calculating the um, second omega, as I term it here. Um, I didn't really need to do that, but I, I'm sort of laboring the solution a little bit here. So can I let you do this question? It's very straightforward, really. Initially, you're going to calculate the initial kinetic energy, the half I omega 1 squared, where omega 1 is shown here. Work out the value, and you can work it out your um, half I omega 2 squared term, which is this one over here. Uh, and then you're going to work out your change in kinetic energy, which is shown here in the form at the bottom. Can I let you do that? The answer is given is 21% here. See if you get 21% for your calculations there. And the sort of change in kinetic energy, the change in um, uh, fluctuation of energy, which is really what we're interested in, that's going to be a, a main parameter. And a lot of the exercises we'll look at will be given uh, a starting point, will be knowing the change in fluctuation of energy. Okay, so my Ke1 I get is um, 78,952 joules or newton meters, whatever you want to use. So that gives me the Ke1 I'm going to use in my equation in a moment. To find the change in kinetic energy. And my Ke2 calculated. And I get 21%. So that change in speed of 10% there, my change in kinetic energy is actually 21%. You can actually just, this is just for reference, really, you can actually work it out by just looking at the, um, the change in the omega. It's 1.1 factor in the omega, and by squaring that, you can work out the same value. But I just wanted to go through the process, just making you aware of the kinetic energy formula. Let's have a look at exercise three then. A bit more calculations involved here. This we're actually going to find the diameter of a flywheel here. So this is our sort of first little design exercise. You know, we want to look at it like that. So the greatest amount of energy which is to be stored uh, by an engine flywheel is 900 joules. So that will be our delta E then. When the average speed, average engine speed, is 3000 RPM. Now this is a parameter we need to be um, comply with. The variation in speed must be limited to plus or minus 2%. And we're also given the mass of the flywheel is 35 kilograms. So what we've got to do in this particular case is to calculate the diameter D of the flywheel. It says it would be manufactured from a solid cast iron ring. So that means it's just a solid disc as far as we're concerned here. Okay, so as always with these questions, let's take the information from the from the question. So the engine flywheel, 900 joules, that will be my delta E. My average engine speed, my omega mean, will be 3,000 RPM. And my variation in speed, that's the 2% uh, given, that will be symbol A here. So on my next slide, okay, exercise so 3 solution. We know that the energy stored by the flywheel has to be 900 joules. So delta E is 900 joules. The average engine speed is 3000 RPM. So 3000 RPM. That's our capital omega mean. Straight away convert it into our lowercase omega value of 314.2 radians per second. We're given that the variation in speed must be limited to plus or minus 2%. So plus or minus 2%, that means plus or minus 0 0.02, or an A value of 0 0.04. And the mass of the flywheel is 35 kilograms, so the M is 35 kilograms. We now have to think what equations we need to help us solve this problem. So I think the equation delta E is equal to AI omega mean squared is useful here. We know what the change in energy is, we're given in the question, we know what A is. We've calculated that in the question. So then we know the I in this equation. We've got the mass given in the question. We can rearrange the equation to find the radius duration squared, which we can then put into this equation. The K squared equals D squared upon 8. So obviously knowing the K squared here, we can rearrange 
to find the d squared and then the d. So that's my process through the solution here. Then to find the i value, we need to rearrange the change in energy equation, so we divide both sides by a and the omega mean squared. So this is our transposition. I'll let you finish the question from there. Okay, here's the solution to exercise three. So commencing with the equation, change in energy, we rearrange it to find the moment of inertia, I, and that calculates to be 0 0.22797 kilogram meter squared. Then using the equation for moment of inertia, we rearrange to find the radius duration squared, and that evaluates to 0 0.06514 meters squared. Then finally using the equation for K squared, we rearrange the equation to find the diameter d. And the outside diameter d is 0 0.2283 meters. Right, exercise four, let's go through that, go for it. Now we've got to find the radius duration of the flywheel. Given the engine speed is required to remain between 550 RPM and 650 RPM, and the mass has to be limited to, it's like a design constraint, 50 kilograms. The greatest fluctuation of energy is 900 joules. So again, it's a nice little straightforward question really. Take the information from the question. So 550 RPM is our minimum speed. So don't forget to convert that straight away to radians per second. 650 RPM was the maximum speed. We've got to convert that of course to radians per second. We're given in the question the mass of the flywheel. So 50 kilograms were given. And we've got the fluctuation energy. 900. So again, from what I can see, the same same approach required here. We will use the delta E equation. From the delta E equation, we're going to find the I value. So I can find my I value in this case, given all the other parameters. We'll be able to rearrange that once we found the I value. We can then use that to find the K squared value and then the K value. You will need your omega mean, of course, here, because the equation is omega mean, but you've got the maximum minimum, so you can find omega mean. Yeah, quite straightforwardly, really. And there's my solution for exercise four, if you want to compare yours with mine. I've got an I value of 1.386 kilogram meters squared. My I equals mk squared equation, I can rearrange to find the k. So, so exercise five, let's read it through. So the greatest amount of energy, which has to be stored by an engine flywheel, is 2,000 joules, as I dealt with the E straight away. Uh, the average engine speed is 240 RPM. The variation in speed has to be limited to plus or minus 1% in this case. And the uh, mass of the flywheel is 450 kilograms. So the flywheel is now to be manufactured from a cast iron ring have an internal diameter, little d that is, 0 0.9 of the external diameter, d. Hmm, that's a more interesting characteristic. Again, you can kind of see what they're doing there, though. We're trying to you know, have a very thick ring here, because the more mass you have at the periphery, the, the, the better it is from the moment of inertia perspective. So we've got to determine the external diameter and the thickness of the rim and the length of the flywheel. So quite a bit of geometry. We're actually really designing this, this flywheel in a bit more detail here. Density of the cast iron is 7.2 megagrams per meter cubed. So again, we need to be careful with that information. So we really are designing it here. We've got to calculate the outside diameter. Once we know the outside diameter, know the inside diameter, we've got the relationship between them because little d is 0 0.9 of the big D. And then get the thickness when we've got the inside and outside diameter. We'll know the mass, we'll know the density. I think we'll be able to then find the length of the flywheel, if you like. So, this is a bit more complicated. The same kind of process to begin with, though, in what we're going to do. So, let's um, again, let's take the information in the question. Quite a bit of information to take here. Okay, so we're given the 2000 joules. That's my delta E in this case. I've got my mean speed, 240 RPM. Convert that straight away into my radians per second. So the variation speed limited to plus or minus 1%. So don't forget plus or minus 1%. That's plus or minus 0 0.01. So that would be 0 0.02 in the calculation for the A. We're given the mass of the flywheel. 
for 50. And then we've got these relationships between the internal diameter is 0.9 of the outside diameter. So we need to be careful with that. Finally, we've got the density. So that's 7.2 megagrams per meter cubed. That's the same density. Mass density is 7,200 kilograms per meter cubed. We need to put it in kilograms. So just notice the conversion there. Okay, exercise five. Let's think through the solution process here. We're given in the question, the change in stored energy, delta E is 2,000 joules. We've got the fluctuation in speed, A, in the question. And we've calculated the omega mean in terms of the radians per second. So looking at this equation here for the change in fluctuation of energy, we've got the change in energy, we've got the A, we've got the omega mean. So we could rearrange the equation to find the moment of inertia, I, from this equation. We could then put it into the equation for I is equal to mk squared. We know the I then, we know the mass given in the question. We could rearrange the equation to find the radius duration squared. We could then put that into this equation, the k squared equals to the outside diameter squared plus the inside diameter squared divided by 8. But the problem here is that we have two unknowns. We know the k squared from the line above, but we don't know the capital D, the outside diameter, and we don't know the inside diameter. However, we do know a relationship between the inside diameter and the outside diameter. The inside diameter is 0.9 times the outside diameter. So what essentially we've got now are simultaneous equations. We've got two equations, both with capital D and lowercase d unknown. So using the substitution method, we could substitute the 0 0.9 times the capital D into this equation for the lowercase d. This would now produce an equation in terms of capital D, so we could rearrange the equation and solve directly for D. I would encourage you to rearrange the equation now and find the outside diameter, capital D. You know the value of k because you've calculated k, so you can rearrange them to find d. Here's my solution that I went through here. So I get the 1.247 for d, and of course once you've got big d, you can find little d because of the relationship between them. So little d is 0.9 times the big d. So I get the inside diameter as well. So once you've found the inside and outside diameter, you can find the thickness. So t is the thickness, so that will give you the thickness. I've asked for the thickness. Now what they also want is the length, that I'll call it L. We're trying to find the L, that's the unknown. But we do know that density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. So I could write that, I'll just rearrange the equation simpler, multiply both sides by V. We know that the mass is the density multiplied by the volume. Or mass is equal to the density of the volume could be the area multiplied by the length. So what do we know in the question? Just think back to the question. We know the mass because it's given in the question. We know the density. We've converted that to appropriate units. I can calculate the area of an annulus. I can do that quite easily. And then I can rearrange to find L. So what you need to do to finish the question off is to rearrange the equation for L. And that's the L they're trying to find here. So we're arranging mass divided by the density, you've got the density, and you can work out the area. I use this formula for my area. And I'll to find the length. Then you've got the, the geometry then for your flywheel, and that's what they're looking for. That should hopefully give you 270 millimeters. So here's the final solution for exercise five. We have to calculate the flywheel thickness. So thickness is equal to the outside diameter minus the inside diameter, or divided by two. So 0 0.062 meters or 62 millimeters is the actual thickness. Going back to this dimension here in our diagram. Then we've got to calculate the flywheel length. They've called it L. So from the equation, mass is equal to density multiplied by volume, where volume is A multiplied by the length. We know the area. We can calculate the area in the question. We can determine the value of A. And then rearranging the equation for L then here we just put the values given in the question 450 kilograms is the mass the, the density is 7200 and the area from above that we just calculate is 0.2308 from that we can work out what the 
Length is a term in the question of the flywheel is going to be. It's 0 0.27 meters or 270 millimeters. And that's this dimension across here. Question three. Can I leave you with that question there? An engine runs at a mean speed of 100 RPM. So the fluctuation speed is limited to 1.5% of the mean speed. And the maximum variance of energy supplied is 6.5 kilojoules. Find the mass of the flywheel required if the radius of duration is 1,000 millimetres. So question three and um, question four. Look, can I leave you with those questions? Have a play with. Let's consider a torque applied to the flywheel. So if a flywheel is given an input torque, Ti, shown in the figure, at an angle of velocity omega i, shown here, this will cause the flywheel to increase speed. If a load or other output acts on the flywheel, it creates an opposing torque, TO, shown here, at an angle of velocity of omega o, shown here. And this causes the flywheel to reduce speed. The following equation is found by applying Newton's second law to the situation. So summation of all the torques applied equals I alpha. In this case, it's Ti minus TO equals I alpha. Call that equation 12. Where Ti minus TO equates to the net torque, T net applied to the flywheel. And this will induce an angular acceleration symbol alpha. Let's now consider machines that offer variable resistance. So within the previous discussion, the engine was assumed to offer a constant resisting torque. However, some applications offer distinctly variable resistance. For example, electric motor driving a press or a shaping machine. Although the turning moment now consists of a uniform input torque, and variable resisting torque, the analysis is identical with the engine application. A press output torque would be expected to be high during the pressing operation, almost zero during times between the pressing operations. And figure nine shows this here. So in the working stroke shown here, the flywheel is releasing energy is equal to the delta E, what's termed the fluctuation of energy. During the idling stroke, the flywheel is now absorbing energy equal to the delta E, change in energy. And the working stroke added to the idling stroke relates to one cycle of the machine's operation. So during the pressing operation, the motor must deliver a higher torque than the mean torque input with the result that the motor slows down. During the remainder of the cycle, the motor is delivering a greater torque than that required, and this increases the speed. Thus, this results in both a fluctuation of speed and energy. If power, capital P, considerations are required, then the following relationship is very useful. P is equal to the work done divided by the time taken. Got that equation 13 here. Don't forget work is in Newton meters and time is in seconds. Here's an updated summary of all our equations with the Newton second law added and the power equation now added. Let's consider a flywheel question related to a variable resistance application. Exercise 6. A 3 kilowatt motor drives a flywheel which provides the energy for a machine press. At commencement of the pressing operation, the flywheel speed, it's called the maximum speed here, is 240 rpm. And each press takes 0.8 seconds to occur, requiring 5.5 kilojoules of energy. If the moment of inertia of the flywheel is 50 kilogram meters squared, we've got to determine the reduction in the speed of the flywheel after each 
pressing operation and also the maximum number of pressings that can be made per minute. If we assume 80% of the energy lost by the flywheel is taken up by the press tool, we've got to calculate the average force exerted when the stroke of the press tool is 40 millimeters. Answers are shown in the brackets. Let's now consider the solution to exercise six. To extract the information of the question, we know that the motor power is three kilowatts, so power is 3000 watts. The maximum speed of the flywheel is 240 RPM, which we've converted here into radians per second. The time taken for a pressing is 0.8 seconds, so 0.8 seconds. And the energy required for the pressing is 5.5 kilojoules, that's 5,500 joules. We know the moment of inertia of the flywheel is 50 kilogram meters squared. And the length of the pressing stroke is 40 millimeters. So put that into meters here. So here's part A of our solution. The amount of energy supplied by the motor in 0.8 of a second. So to find the energy supplied by the motor during the operation, that will be the 3000 watts multiplied by the duration of the pressing. So that's 2400 joules. So to find the fluctuation energy required, delta E, that will be the energy for the pressing operation minus the energy supplied by the motor over the time which the pressing acts. So that will be 5,500 joules. That's the energy required for the pressing operation. And we're subtracting for that what the energy is that the motor emits in 0.8 seconds. So our delta E in this case is 3,100 joules. So in our diagram, the fluctuation in the energy extracted from the flywheel is 3,100 joules. 2,400 joules is supplied by the motor. So part two here, we have to calculate the minimum speed of the flywheel to find the reduction in speed. And that's based on the fluctuation in energy. So from the change in energy is equal to the half I omega max squared minus the omega min squared. We need to rearrange the equation to find the omega min. Rearranging the equation and putting the numbers into the equation, that becomes 22.528 radians per second. And converting that into RPM, that's 215 RPM. So that's the minimum speed of the flywheel when releasing the change of energy of 3,100 joules. Step three. Find the change in speed of the flywheel, that's the difference between the maximum speed and the minimum speed. So that's 25 RPM in this case. Part four, we have to find the maximum number of operations that can be performed per minute. So the total energy supplied by the motor per minute is 3000 watts multiplied by 60 seconds. So that equates to 180,000 joules. The energy consumed in one pressing operation we know is 5,500 joules in the question. So the number of operations per minute will be the energy supplied per minute divided by the energy required for one pressing operation. So in this case, 180,000 joules is applied per minute. Divide that by 5,500. The number of operations is 32.7. Normally, 32 pressing operations can be undertaken within one minute. So for reference, the time for one cycle to occur is the 60 seconds divided by 32 operations per second. So 1.875 seconds per cycle. And the constant motor output torque is simply the power divided by the average angular velocity. So that's 3,000 the power supplied divided by the 23.83 radians per second. So 126 newton meters is the average torque. So adding to our diagram, the time for one cycle is 1.875 seconds. And the constant motor torque is 126 newton meters. 
And finally, part B of the question, we're asked to calculate the average force exerted during a pressing operation. Well, the actual quantity of energy used in the pressing, the delta E, is going to be the 5,500 applied from the flywheel multiplied by 0 0.8. Note that the 0 0.8 in this calculation relates to the assumed 80% of the energy given up by the flywheel is actually taken up by the press tool. So the 0 0.8 relates to the efficiency of the transfer of energy from flywheel to press tool. So the change in energy that's actually useful in the pressing is 4,400 joules, so the work that's done. And we know that work done, W there, is force multiplied by the distance traveled, where the distance traveled in this case relates to the length of the pressing stroke, symbol S, which is 0 0.040 meters. So rearranging the average force, F, is equal to the work done divided by the distance traveled. So 4,400 is the work or the energy used, and we divide that by 0 0.04, which is the distance traveled. And that gives us 110,000 newtons, or 110 kilonewtons, as the average force exerted during the pressing operation.